Good morning, and welcome to Hickory Hammock Baptist Church. We are so glad that you've decided to join us this morning. If you would like more information on Hickory Hammock, please visit us on the web at hickoryhammockbaptist.org, or you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. We are looking forward to joining our hearts and voices in worship this morning. Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to all of us. Happy birthday, dear church. Today is Pentecost. Today is Pentecost. Today is Pentecost. And you'll still be hard-pressed to find a church you can go to all over the world. I am so reminded of Revelation 12, 12. We just went through Resurrection Sunday, and there were hardly any churches you could go to anywhere for the first time since the church was born. And here we are at Pentecost, and our cities are on fire, and the National Guard has been called out all over the nation. Trump has promised the military to various cities. I'm reminded of Revelation 12, 12. Woe unto you, earth, in these days, for Satan has been thrown down to you, and he is filled with rage because he knows his time is short. When you consider those two things that I just said connected to the church and the fact that today is Pentecost, we were here on Resurrection Sunday. We are here at the birth of the church celebration. We will not miss this birthday celebration. By the way, turn to Acts 2 while I'm talking because that's where we're going to go. And beyond. To infinity and beyond. That's, what's, that's what I'm going to holler in the rapture. I'm taking up to infinity and beyond. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Mm. But when I think about, for the first time in 2,000 years, which means the first in history, because it was 2,000 years ago when the church was born, 2020 years, well, something like that, because of the, the timing of the different calendars. Let's just say 2,000 years ago the church was born. Uh, so for the first time, in the whole history of the church, there was a resurrection Sunday where all over the globe you could barely find a church. First time ever. For the first time ever on the birthday of the church, the celebration of the birthday of the church, all over the globe you'll be hard-pressed to find a church. And if you find one, you'll be hard-pressed to find a message on Pentecost. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you'll be hard-pressed to find churches where the people don't even know what the seven feasts of the Lord are and don't really even know what Pentecost is and what it means. The Feast of Shavuot in Hebrew. By the way, I think Zev Peratt and his family is watching and a lot of other friends and family and, and, and born-again believers and Orthodox Jews who have, who have surrendered their life to Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus as Christ. They're watching right now. Hello, guys. And I know it's evening for you, and so... Uh, Happy Shavuot to you. But here's my point. When you take Revelation 12, 12, that says <laughs> Satan knows his time is short. And when you take Resurrection Sunday and Shavuot, just 50 days apart from each other, and realize that these are the first times in the history of the church and the planet when basically the church was shut down during this time all over the world, I think Satan knows something that even the church doesn't know. Revelation 12, 12 says, he, he will do these things because he knows his time is short. Which means he has to hurry up and try to get his Messiah on a throne somewhere. He's got to try to seize the throne of God. He's got to try to make this planet heaven on earth. It's all a big lie. It's all a big masquerade. I'm going to write a book and call it Masquerade. See, those of you that laughed are the only ones that's read my book. See, I've got one called Masquerade. Wrote it last year. 
read it. It'll blow you away how prophetic it became. I had no idea. I'm not taking any credit for the prophetic nature of it. That's all from the Holy Spirit of God. But here we are living in the midst of a lot of stuff that I talked about in that book when I was writing it in the middle of last year. And here we are. I also wrote a book some years ago called Be Thou Prepared. If you've read that, you know that I talked about these days way back then. And people laughed because I was way ahead of my time about seven years ago when I wrote that. <laughs> Seven years ago, people couldn't imagine that all the churches would be shut and everybody would be locked in their homes while criminals were being released. And you couldn't find a church on Resurrection Sunday and you couldn't find one on Shavuot. And, and that all the major cities in the United States would basically be on fire and police cars in New York City would be on fire and c police stations and city hall. The city hall in Nashville would be burned practically to the ground. But I said, be thou prepared. Here's what the Bible says, and here's how to do it. It's a, it's a manual. I'm, this is not a cheap advertisement for books. I'm just telling you, I'm saying all that to say that you've got some resources if you want them, but the most important thing I'm trying to say is, is that God has had this stuff on my heart for a long, long time. And one way or the other, we've preached it, and we've studied the Word together, and we've talked about it, and we've contemplated it. So here we are now on Shavuot, on, Pent on Pentecost. The day the church was born, it is one of the seven feasts of the Lord. The feasts start with Passover, and then unleavened bread, and then the feast of first fruits. All of those were fulfilled in Jesus Christ in Passion Week. All of them fall on specific days. The feast of first fruits, where you celebrate the first fruits from the ground, that was Resurrection Sunday. That's when it fell. And then count down 50 days from there, and you come in to the fourth feast, the feast of of Pentecost, the celebration of the birth of the church. But now, wait a minute. You say, but wait, yeah, so it was born on Pentecost, but I mean, these were all Jews, and so they've had Pentecost for thousands of years before that. They've had Shavuot. They've had the law since Mount Sinai about the Feast of the Lord. All that's written in, in Leviticus. So they didn't celebrate the birth of the church. As a matter of fact, the Orthodox Jews pretty much hate the church, the whole concept of the church. So what did they celebrate? One of the major elements of the Feast of Pentecost among the Orthodox, they celebrate the birth of Israel. Well, when was Israel birthed as a nation? At the foot of Mount Sinai, at the giving of the law, Israel was born. That's what they celebrate. So, a thousand five hundred years later, on that very same day, the church was born at the giving of the Holy Spirit. After Israel was born, at the giving of the law, Moses came down, and they were dancing around a golden calf. You know what God did? He killed 3,000 of them as a sign. You know what happened 1,500 years later when the church was born and the Holy Spirit was given? 3,000 people were saved that day. God keeps very immaculate records and books. You're going to hear in just a few moments about the 3,000 saved, and I want you to remember when you read that, the reason this is mentioned in the New Testament is without commentary because the early church, they were all Jews. They knew when they saw these numbers and they understood what happened that day, they thought all the way back to Mount Sinai and the golden calf and rebellion, even as the law was being given. And as a sign... Three, the number of God, by a thousand. A thousand years is like a day. Day is like a thousand years. A thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. These are important numbers. It's not numerology. It's important biblical numbers. Three thousand people God killed that day. Rebellious people. People doing this to him and worshiping an idol. But on the day the church was born and the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 people said, I give my life to Jesus. And almost all of them were Jews. Pretty exciting. And for those of us that are not Jews, all we can do is hit our knees and praise God that he allowed Gentiles in. The church doesn't belong to the Gentiles. It doesn't belong to the Jews. According to Ephesians chapter 2, it belongs to the one new man, Jew and Gentile, under the blood of Jesus. 
We are the ones making up the temple of the last days. Only place in the New Testament where it literally talks about a literal third temple is when it talks about the church and our bodies and us together, Jew and Gentile, being the temple of God in the last days. It literally says those things. And here we are. And Satan effectively shut the temple down. Not everywhere. And there were smattering and scattering of hickory hammocks all over the world. There were. We're not the lone strangers, but 99.5% probably closed. Some of them under penalty of law, death, having businesses taken, fines, jail, depending upon what part of the world you're in. Or should I say, depending upon what part of the United States you were in. Even when they started opening, I read articles to you of churches under government orders. There's a county in California. I read it to you. 200,000 people live there. It's about the size of Santa Rosa County. The, the county commissioners, let's pretend like the county commissioners did something like that here. The county commissioners ordered the churches. We'll let you go back. We'll let you. Now, you can go to Walmart, <laughs> but we'll let you go back to church, provided no more than 50 people can meet. Well, what if you got a church of 3,000? 50. And you don't sing because singing can spread the virus. California, folks. The whole nation of Germany did that. Forbid every church from singing. Like the headlines say right now, America's burning down starting last night. Over a, over a hundred different cities this is going on. And I like that headline. It was We all laughed, but so sad. I guess social distancing is over now. <laughs> How hypocritical. This whole mess. How hypocritical. And again, to the church at large all over the world, not specific churches or specific pastors or people, to the church at large all over the world, shame, 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 shame in the midst of this. What if the churches at large all over the world says, we're not closing, we're standing? Are they, are they, are they going to put a million pastors in prisons? Are they going to put a, a couple of million uh, a billion people, a couple of billion worshipers in jails and prisons. I mean, what? I mean, there comes a time, folks, when the faith has to go away, when the fear has to go away, the faith has to come, and the stand has to be taken. There comes a time. All right, you can give the Lord a hand. Listen, that's what our founding fathers did in the War of Independence. Two-thirds of the colonists didn't even help fight. One-third of the colonists gave us our independence for 240-something years that it looks like we're on the verge of losing. Our founding fathers foresaw a day like this if we did not appreciate what we had and literally fought to keep it. So in the midst of all of this, here we are at Shavuot. This should be a very special one, just like last Resurrection Sunday, I hope, will be a special one. I didn't know Logan was going to sing that song. Did you get? Did you notice he was singing Psalm 91 and, and parts of Isaiah? I, I had no idea that was the song he was singing. I think the Lord is in this service. What do you all think? Okay, so here's what happened. Now, listen, I've preached a lot of sermons on Acts chapter 2 and Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming upon those that were waiting for the promise that Jesus gave at his ascension. I've preached a lot about them speaking in tongues and what that means and what it doesn't mean. Uh, I don't have time to do all that this morning, but I've done it before. I will do it again, and I'll do it in men's Bible studies, and I'll do it from this pulpit. So, But I just want you to know, here's the, here's the bottom line truth to what happened. The church was born on the platform of the miraculous. Jesus had promised, you wait, the Holy Spirit will come. And it was timed just perfectly from heaven that it would fall on Pentecost, which is the celebration of the ingathering of the new grain. 
No longer with the old grain. It's gone. Now it's the new grain coming. Now it's the in gathering. Now it's the time of the in gathering. Do you get it? Do you get the picture? This is why God preserved that day. And so they were waiting. And the Holy Spirit of God came upon them at once. See, the Holy Spirit of God has always been moving among His people. But He would anoint and touch and fill leaders and, and priests and prophets. And, and, but, but the promise was, Jesus gave the promise, but when I am gone to the Father and when I send the Holy Spirit, then He will infill all believers, all born again. And you'll be marked with a seal, Ephesians says. You see, there's, so there's a little nuance of difference. That's why when David sinned, over in Psalm 51, you hear his, his prayer of repentance. He says, Lord... Do anything you want, but don't take your Holy Spirit from me. See, he, he recognized that, that that gift of the Holy Spirit he had in him was an anointing from God, and it was a very sweet and special gift. He had wisdom while he had it. He had the ability to lead and command armies and at the same time to bring the ark into, the, into Jerusalem and become a picture of a priest and a king, a picture of Jesus. That's why when he sinned, he realized what he had done. And he said... Do anything else you want to me, Lord. Beat me up, beat me down, but please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. So that's why Jesus gave the promise at Pentecost, you go, you wait, you just worship, you worship, you worship. Now, they didn't know, but it would only be 10 days. But he said, now my Holy Spirit will come and you will be overshadowed overpowered with the power from God's throne. And that's what happened that day. Because the Bible speaks of something audible that was heard. And again, 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, there was no noise pollution. Oh, you might hear the tinkering of a hammer or people talking or children and stuff. There are no airplanes. There are no interstate highways around the old city with traffic and cars and horns honking and sirens blaring. None of that. It would have been very crispy still. Birds singing, children, you know. Wife is blessing out her husband, four streets over, you can hear it. That's what, that's what it would have been like. And the Bible says that in that time there was something like, and the word like means it wasn't this, but it was like, it was all they could describe. Something like a mighty rushing wind. We would describe that as a straight line storm or a hurricane. Something happened. There was no wind, yet they heard the sound. And the people trembled. And they, they could feel that it was coming from a place. And the Bible says that people, everybody in Jerusalem, kind of went down the thin streets and found their ways looking for this sound. What's going on? There's no volcanoes around. The earth's not moving under our feet. But that's what it sounds like. And they found that it was coming from this upper room with obviously a balcony where Peter came out to preach and where they had been worshiping. And then while they were there and this was happening, the Bible says that those inside saw, and I'm convinced it's the mark. I think they saw the mark. They said they saw something like little tongues of fire over their heads, something like it wasn't real fire and they weren't real tongues. It was just a little wisp of, of a bright light. And you, having believed, you were marked, marked with a seal. So it was a day filled with the miraculous. It was a day filled with the power of God. And then when, when they were worshiping, when all of this happened, and Peter gets up to speak and to preach, it, the Bible describes it as there were God-fearing Jews and, and, and even some Gentiles among them who were converted to Judaism, the Bible says. And, and the Jews allowed that. If you worship the one true God, they would baptize you, actually. And you would be a part of the Jewish family. And they were all of those people there. So basically Jews, either those that were born and, born and raised and, and DNA Jews and those that were Gentiles that were converted, they were in that crowd. And it names the 12 different language groups that were there. And they started talking amongst themselves. Says, Why is it that we hear this message in our own native language? Not a shandalakai, my father bought a helicopter. None of that was there. None of that was there. None of that was there. I'm not trying to be disparaging. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. Three times it says we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own native language. What's going on? Well, it's the power of God. It's the miraculous. It causes people to say, what's happening among those people? Are you following me? Our own native language. Now, obviously, there was a miracle of hearing too, right? 
God, Peter didn't get up and speak, and there were like 13 or 14 language groups represented. If you go through and read them all, he didn't speak in 14 languages. He didn't start, he was pre preaching in Hebrew, more than likely. Aramaic. He, he didn't start first with Aramaic and then say, okay, now let me switch over here to this. And, and okay, now I'm done there. Now let me switch to this. Let me do this 14 times. Y'all hang around now for about eight hours, okay, because I'm going to preach this message. That's not how he did it. He just preached. And the people heard him. And they said to each other, no, I'm hearing it in my language. No, I'm hearing it in my language. And by the way, he's speaking perfectly. In my, how, can he do, how can he speak perfectly in 14 different languages? Well, he kind of wasn't, or if he was, I don't think he knew. The Bible didn't say anything about him knowing it. But the people heard it. Why? Because the gospel was being born. And God was going to put the gospel to all the nations. That's why I tell the church all the time, folks, we've been called to be ambassadors, missionaries, and ministers to the world. But if we won't do it, God will do it, and he'll hold us accountable. God doesn't need Carl Gallops to preach. But he called me to, and he's holding me accountable for it. What do you mean God doesn't need you? Well, I dropped dead right now. And guess what? The gospel's still going to be preached. It's still going to go. It's still somehow. And if all the human mouths in the world shut up, what did Jesus say? The rocks will cry out. Yeah, but what if the Internet goes down and we don't have Google Translate? I don't know. Ask Peter. Maybe, maybe the Spirit of God will let people hear it in their own native language. Gee, I don't know if God can work those miracles anymore. I think miracles have died. <laughs> there are whole denominations built around that lie. Well, how come God's not working miracles anymore? Oh, well, just wait. Just wait. Just wait. That's how I'm going to close the sermon. So hang in here. Don't, if you get mad during this next part, don't get up and leave because you're really going to like the last one, okay? I have to say that because almost every Sunday somebody gets up. And <laughs> That's okay. Watch this. Let's hear Peter's sermon. Verse 14, then Peter stood up with the 11. Those were the other disciples. And, of course, Judas was gone, but they had picked Matthias. Peter stood up with the 11. He raised his voice. He addressed the crowd, fellow Jews. And all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. You listen carefully to what I say. These men that you hear worshiping and you hear them in your own language, I'm, I'm adding those words because that's what it means. These men, they're not drunk as you suppose. The reason he said that, because if you'll read a few verses earlier, they didn't know what to make of what they were hearing and seeing. And the, these guys speaking, they thought, were speaking in all these different languages. And somebody in the crowd said, they must be drunk. And I've always said, how much liquor do you have to have to be able to speak 14 different languages? <laughs> Perfectly. There's some really good pain pills out there, but can't none of them make you speak in 14 different languages perfectly. In fact, you can't, sp you can't go to school for the rest of your life and learn 14 different languages to speak them perfectly. Well, that's impossible. Yeah, with men, but not with God. Are you with me? Not with God. That's why Peter's getting on to him because he, he heard some of that. Eh, they must be drunk or something. Well, then how? Are, then you must be drunk because you're hearing it in your own language. Takes a drunk to hear a drunk. I, I, can I, get, I saw about a bunch of hands went up and said, amen. Oh, okay. I don't know what that means. I'm going to stay out of that. Okay, here we go. So he says, they, they, I heard you, brother. He said, I've been there. I know, I know, brother. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. He says, it's only 9 in the morning. In other words, we, we don't even start drinking around here until then. <laughs> Verse 16. No, this, what you're saying, it's what the prophet Joel spoke of. And he quotes it. In the last days, God says. And by the way, I know you're saying, but it wasn't the last days. That was 2,000. No, it was the last day. The last days began when Jesus was resurrected. You do know the resurrection of Jesus and the birth of the church both stand like this in front of Satan. Which is why in this first time ever that he shut down both of those around the world, I think Satan knows something we don't know. I think we're close. I don't set dates. All I know is Satan thinks we're close. And I know Revelation 12, 12. 
This is what Joel said about the last days. In those days I will pour out my spirit on all people. See, not just kings, not just priests, not just prophets now. On all people. And the implication is who come to Jesus Christ. Your sons and your daughters then will be able to prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I'm insulted by that. I told you all about the dream that I had some years ago. And I finally got up the nerve once I had witnesses that could verify. And it's a long story, but it's in my book. Mm. I think it's a masquerade. Yeah, it's a masquerade. It's near the end of masquerade. And um, so I recount the whole thing. It's on the Internet in, in video format, and millions of people around the world have seen it. We're still getting people calling in and writing in saying, oh, my gosh, thank you for sharing that. I've had the same dream. Thousands of people, without exaggerating. And I was, to young people, I was an old man when I dreamed that dream. Every time I read this, I say, dang, why did I have to be the old man that dreamed a dream? Why couldn't I have been a young man? Because I came here when I was 30. Why couldn't I have seen visions? Actually, I did. <laughs> and was sharing them with you and preaching them way back then. But when I became an old man, God said, okay, visions are over. Now you're going to dream dreams. <laughs> yeah, enough of that. Why does so much of my serious preaching sound like a comedy show? You know, well, see, there's just a lot of humor in life, isn't there? I'm so convinced that so many times God looks at Michael and Gabriel and says, Hey, y'all come here. Michael over here. Gabriel over here. Now watch this. <laughs> I'm so convinced God does that in my life. <laughs> Probably in yours as well. Okay. Verse 18, and even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Folks, we're seeing the signs on the earth below right now. Church shut down, Israel's reborn, Jerusalem's the capital, church shut down on Pentecost and, and Easter, or this is what the world calls it, on Resurrection Sunday. I mean, riots, lawlessness, burning, looting, and all over the world, disease, pestilence, lockdowns. These are the signs all over the earth. They're signs. Does that mean it's going to happen tomorrow? No, nobody's setting dates. This doesn't set dates. It's just saying when you see these signs, get oil in your lamps. Don't be one of the foolish ones. Be ready. Be thou prepared. How about that? Let's keep going. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. You know, that's happening all over our nation today. It's just a little microcosm of this blood in the streets. Fire, billows of smoke in over a hundred cities in America last night. The sun will be turned to darkness in those days and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. You do know the Lord is coming. I mean, I, I mean, for anybody that mocks and scoffs or even goes, yeah, but I don't know if I believe all that. Do you believe that Israel's back? Do you believe that Jerusalem's back? Do you believe that the world was shut down on Resurrection Sunday? Do you believe? You're living in the midst of the signs. It's just the beginning. Keep reading. Verse 22, Peter's preaching on that day 2,000 years ago. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you and, uh, through him. As you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God, set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, he's talking about the Romans, so it wasn't the Jews that put him to death. It was Jews, Gentiles, it was uh, the whole world, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. The prophet David said about him, and now he's going to quote Psalm 16. I've gone to this many times over the years and shown you that the resurrection is spoken of in Psalm 16. I saw the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with the joy in your presence. Brothers, Peter says, I can tell you with confidence that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. You can see his tomb still if you go to this city of David. Now, the remains aren't there because they've been pillaged down through the thousands of years. But um, by conquering Muslims and 
armies, but the tomb is still right there in the Kidron Valley. Verse 30, but he was a prophet. And by the way, it's like a, just like a small pyramid. It's, you, you can't miss it, okay? I mean, you know, it's, a, it's not like just a, a gravestone with a headstone. No, 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 it's a, t- a tomb for a king. It's still there. But he was a prophet. David was a prophet. And he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. And you say, well, how's it? won't let his holy one see decay. Well, that means he, he, he won't. He'll come out of the grave. But that word decay is important because when that psalm was written and all the way into Jesus' day, they all knew, the people knew that in that part of the world, they didn't have all the wonderful embalming that we have. And I mean, they had some embalming spices because the women were going to go to the tomb to do that. But, but it was spices that you put on the outside. They didn't know how to draw all those fluids out and then substitute it with preservatives and all that. They didn't, they didn't do that. So decay sets in on the third day. So since he wouldn't see decay, he would be raised early on the third day, which is what all the New Testament, what all the, Jesus kept saying, the Son of Man will be in the, in the grave three nights, and on the third day he will rise. It's all through the New Testament, on the third day. Not after the third day, because that would be when decay started. That's why Jesus, when Lazarus, when the, when the sisters of Lazarus called, he, he, he told his disciples, he said, look, he's, uh, he's just asleep. And they said, well, what if he's asleep? Why are they calling us? He said, okay, okay, he's dead, okay? I said, he's asleep because you're going to see something. Well, when, are, when he's dead, when are we going to go? What are we going to do? He said, well, we're going to wait until the fourth day. Do you know why? Yeah, so there would be no one say it's a trick. In fact, when he, tried, when he, when he stood up and said, I'm getting ready to open the tomb, remember what Mary said? Don't do that. It stinks now. Remember that? I love the King James. Don't do that. It stinketh. Remember, remember that? That's what all that's about. That's why Peter doesn't have to explain what I just had to explain. He just says to the crowd, David was a prophet. Psalm 16, he told us he would rise on the third day. All right? Keep, keep going here. All right, so, all right, verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. <clears throat> exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father. Can somebody bring my water to me, please, over here? The promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord. Thank you, Brad. The Lord said... To my Lord, I just spilled water all over my Bible. (laughs) If it doesn't smear the ink, I'm going to keep preaching. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel, Peter's still preaching, be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. He is Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? You do know when you're standing in faith, you're exhibiting miracles in your life. You're testifying of those miracles. Just like what was happening, you do know people are going to ask you, how can I have what you have? How can I be saved? That's why the Bible tells us always be prepared in season and out of season to give the reason for the hope that is within you. And do this with gentleness and patience. But do it. You see an example of it here. What must we do? Peter replied, repent. Be baptized. There's some here that need to repent. Some here that need to come to Jesus. Some here that need to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. We're living in prophetic times. It's time. It's time. It's time. You could walk out of here today and die in a car accident. You could walk out of here today and your heart stop. But you don't, we don't have a guarantee of another. Day. Don't put it off. Say, well, I, I'm going to wait a few months. I'm just going to repent and be baptized. Every one of you, Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, that didn't mean the gifts See, a lot of people interpret this as, oh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's tongues. Well, first of all, that's not tongues there. They're speaking in native things. And it doesn't say gifts. It says gift. The gift of what? The Holy Spirit is the gift. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. You'll receive the anointing. You'll receive the knowledge that's on high. You'll come to the Word of God and read it, and all of a sudden you're going to understand it. 
I'm not saying every jot and tittle, but all of a sudden it'll come alive to you. I'm, I'm blessed. I get to preach in front of the world on so many platforms. And sometimes people will say, man, you know, you just make that word come alive. And I said, well, it's because it's alive in my heart. And you know why? Because the Holy Spirit's here. And you know why? Because I'm born again. I get it now. <laughs> there was a time in my life where I read it and some of it was pretty, you know, like John 3, 16 and Psalm 23. That was pretty, but I didn't get it. I didn't get the depths of it. There's still a lot I don't get with jots and tittles, and I'm still learning and digging, and that's the fun going through this treasure trove right here. It never gets old. But now, from Genesis to Revelation, I get it. Why? Because I've got the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because I'm special? No, because I said, Jesus, you are the Holy One. I'm a sinner, a piece of filth, but I give my life to you. And he says, I'm going to mark you, my son, with a mark, the Holy Spirit of God. You got it? Amen. All right, let's keep reading. I'm almost done here. Verse 39. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off for the whole world, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. You might want to underline that. Those words are 2,000 years old, and they're never truer than they are right now. Save yourselves out of this corrupt generation. Look at the next verse. Those who were baptized and accepted the message were about 3,000 added to their number that day. <laughs> now you know the significance of that. Guys, listen to me. The church, born in power. The church born and miraculous. The church born in faith. The church born with the throne of God touching the people of earth. The church born that way. And what did Jesus tell the disciples way up at Caesarea Philippi, right outside a place called the gates of hell? He said, and on this rock, that declaration of Peter's faith, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And he probably pointed to that, that cave where they did human sacrifice. It's called the gates of hell. He says, and even the gates of hell are not going to prevail against my church. Unless they get scared and run and hide and close the doors. <laughs> I'm speaking of generally. Please hear my heart on that now. Because that is what, I, somebody said, I don't like you talking about that. Well, it happened. And we're still living in the midst of it. And it is something that must be spoken to. For too long, pre, uh, pulpits all over this nation, they don't speak about uh, what a real marriage is. They don't speak about what a real gender is. They don't speak about what's really in the womb. They don't speak about Israel's right to exist. They don't speak about prophecy because they don't want to hurt any feelings. Well, I ain't that guy. <laughs> and you're not those people. And so, here we are in the midst of these prophetic times, church born on the platform of miraculous. Peter said that. He said, first of all, Jesus performed many signs and wonders and miracles, and he did them among you. And then he rose from the dead. There's another sign and wonder and miracle. And the dead were raised, and the lepers leaped, and the, and the blind could see, and you saw all of that. And then you saw him ascend after he resurrected. Power, resurrection power, and miracles, and signs, and wonders. Not only is the church born on that, the church lives on that. Now, now in America, a lot of American Christians, they don't get that because we're so Greco-Roman. You know, we basically have a Greco-Roman culture. Uh, that's, that's what Paul dealt with in the church. He dealt with the Jews that were trying to turn everybody into Jews coming into the church. And Paul had to preach it. And he had to deal with the Gentiles, the Greeks, and the Romans because they were, they were always, prove it to me. Give me a sign. I, I ain't believe in nothing unless, unless you can put it through the scientific method. I'm not believing it. Well, there's a lot of benefit to that. I mean, we've, we've, we've invented a lot of things. And, I mean, the fields of technology and medicine and all these things comes through. I got to look at it under a mi microscope. I got to understand. And that's good. And that's, that's knowledge. Sometimes wisdom doesn't come with knowledge, though. 
We have the knowledge how to take a baby out of a womb, but it's not very wise that we would do that. You see what I'm saying? We have the knowledge how to turn a guy into a girl or a girl into a guy, but it's not really wise to do that. This live stream's not going to stay up long. I'm sorry. So watch. So we have a Greco-Roman mindset as a people. N not everybody does. We're a nation of immigrants, so not everybody does. But the nation as a whole, founded by mainly European folks and then the immigrants that came. Greco-Roman. So the church in America long ago decided that the miracles had ceased. I mean, not all the churches, not all the Christians, but, but you can find whole denominations that preach and teach that. Why? Because they think they don't see them around them, and they don't think they see them anymore, so that must be what happened. The only place I see where it says these things will cease is in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, and, and, it, and, it's, and the context is when the Lord returns. That will cease, won't need to anymore. The king of glory will be on the throne. We won't need to have signs and miracles and wonders saying, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, because he'll be here. That's the sign and the miracle and the wonder fulfilled. Amen? Amen? That's the only place where it talks about anything ceasing. Other than that, we're the church. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, and, and I'm not talking down to you. I'm not going to call your name except for three people. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Some of you, and some of you watching by live stream, you're thinking, but you know, Carl, I, I can't remember the last time I saw a miracle in the church. Listen, here's the problem. You know, I've, I've preached many times to you before how people miss prophecy, how we miss, how whole generations miss prophecy. You know, Jesus born in a manger. The whole, the whole Roman world missed it. Oh, some shepherds saw it. And some wise men later saw it. And they were telling people, and everybody was going, yeah, sure, right. There was a, there was a woman, Anna, and was it Simeon? And, and in Simeon at the temple, um, I got a lot of Bible scholars here. I, if I forget something, I just ask it and everybody spouts it out. Um, Anna and Simeon, they, they knew who he was and they prophesied and said this is the Christ when they brought the little baby Jesus to the temple for his dedication and everything. But that's about it. The rest of the world went on his merry way for 30 years until he appeared along the shores of Galilee performing miracles, signs, and wonders. Then everybody didn't come to him to be saved. Everybody came to him to get a miracle worked on them. Feed my belly. Take away my sickness. See how silly we are? Say, well, Brother Carl, I mean, you know, miracle signs and wonders. I'm going to tell you three or four stories here, and I want you to bear with me. Some of you have been here for decades. You were there when these things happened. Some of it is going to be what happened yesterday, literally. Some of it you heard a little bit last Sunday sermon, so bear with me. But this, this is a church. We exalt Jesus. We stand in the Word. We pray over each other and with each other. We expect miracles, and from time to time, God does them. We don't name it and claim it. And we don't say that we can manipulate the throne of God. I'm just saying we expect the miraculous to happen from time to time. You know, even Jesus worked the miracles from time to time. He didn't heal everybody in the world. He didn't take away all the leprosy in the world. He didn't raise all the dead. What a mess that would have been. <laughs> the zombies are back. <laughs> but when he would do those things, when he would open the eyes of the blind, it was to show them you're blind spiritually. And see, if I can open this man's physical eyes and that impresses you, think what I can do when I open your spiritual eyes. When I raise Lazarus, oh, does that impress you? Wait, wait a few days. You'll see me raise myself. And if I can raise him and if I can raise myself, guess what I can do for you if you would believe? You see, so he would pick his times and places and his miracles, and it was all about exalting the kingdom, not about but not about us being all happy and healthy all the time and no problems because Jesus touched me, Jesus touched me. We live in a fallen world, but we walk with Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit in us. He gives us wisdom and he gives us peace. And even in the midst of the storm, he helps us to keep our eyes on him. And he keeps us in the perspective that this is not paradise. Have you all noticed that? Yeah, if you lived in one of these big cities last night. 
And that could still come to Milton. But this ain't paradise. The God of this age runs this thing. That's what Jesus called Satan. Okay. I'm going to tell you some stories. I'm going to make a shocking statement. The dead have been raised here. I know some of you are going, he's lost his mind. We knew it. Call the deacons. You know, here, Pat, one of my deacons, is already looking at me saying, oh, brother, here we go. <laughs> no, no, he knows what I'm talking about. Listen, this is just one example. I'll, let, me just, just let me tell you some stories. These are true and witnessed. Every one of them witnessed by people. So a couple of decades ago, we were over in the old sanctuary. It was a Wednesday night prayer meeting. There was a young woman sitting right back there in the corner. She and her husband were prominent people in our church family. She was pregnant. Everything was going fine, months and months and months and months and months. She was getting close to the end of her pregnancy. And she was sitting back there weeping during worship service. She raised her hand at the end when I asked if anybody had any kind of prayer request or praise or something they wanted to share. And she says, I need the church to pray for me. She says, you know, of course I'm pregnant. You can't miss that. And she says, but the problem is there's no heartbeat anymore. And I've been to the doctor several times. We'd wait days and go back just in case it was problems in diagnosis. Remember this, Pat? You, you, you've heard this before. And I'm not putting anything on you. I'm sorry. I just, but you were shaking your head. And that's good. You know, you don't get a heartbeat. Well, there could be different reasons. So you, you know, you wait, you go back, and you've got time. There's a, there's a window there. I mean, because if, if the baby has died, then, then you'll have to take the baby, of course. But, but if the baby hasn't died, then you'll hear the heartbeat. So waited. She goes back. No heartbeat. She goes back like a week later. No heartbeat. Can't find it anywhere. So she's back there weeping. She says, could the church pray for me that maybe, maybe God would work a miracle in this? Not a problem. I said, we're not going to name it and claim it. I don't have any manipulation power, and neither does this church over the throne of God. I said, but may I lay my hands on you, representative of the whole church family, because everybody can't gather around you. She said, sure. And her husband said, yes, no problem. So I went back there, put my hand on her shoulder, asked everybody to stand, and I prayed for God to bring life to that baby. She was crying because the next day she had an appointment to have the baby removed. So she goes in. She tells the doctor the next day, would you just check one more time? They're getting ready to take the baby. The doctor checks. He says, what has happened? The baby's heart is beating. Well, she had a healthy pregnancy. She gave birth to the child. The child is now 20-something years old. The dead have been raised. Now, you say, well, Carl, you don't know. I know what doctors told this woman for weeks. That's all I know. I know she asked us to pray, and the next day, the doctor said, there's a heartbeat. Don't tell me God doesn't work miracles. Now, he, does, he hasn't done that. You give the Lord a hand. He, he hadn't done that every time somebody has that situation. And he certainly hadn't gone out here and raised all for the, from the cemeteries around the, the, you know, the, 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 the city and all. I'm not trying to be ugly about it. I'm just saying that, no, no, that's not. Now, when the Lord returns, guess what the Bible says? No more pain, no more death, no more crying. Uh, the, the dead will be raised to life. The, you know, and I mean, then, then it's going to be across the board for born again people but right now satan's the god of this age and then in the midst of it now is see you say but yeah but jesus isn't here anymore wait a minute what did he call the church my bride and we are the body of christ he is the head so guess what miracles do happen some time back there was a family in our community that had a precious loved one in the hospital at Sacred Heart. I won't, don't have time. not going to go into all the details. Bottom line, she had to have an emergency surgery or she was going to die. The problem was she had a raging fever. And they could not do the surgery with a raging fever because that could kill her. So what they were doing, they had her on watch and... 
And they were coming in. It got down to where you're, the, the, narrow, the gap was closing as to when they could do what they could do. And it got down to the point they were coming into a room every five minutes taking her temperature. Every five minutes, can you imagine? And every five minutes taking her temperature. because And they had the surgical room. They had the surgery room on standby. Everybody was on standby if her temperature ever dropped. The problem was it wasn't. It was still raging and raging and raging. And somebody in our church that was related to these folks called me and said, could you just go over and pray with them? They're just hurting so bad. And I said, sure, sure. So I went over. I introduced myself. They didn't know me. They were so gracious to even allow me in the room. But I told them who it was that had asked me to come. They said, sure. And I said, listen, I said, could I just please pray for her? I can't remember her name right now. Let's just say Mary, okay? I said, can I pray for Mary? And somebody in the room, I don't remember who, I'm not judging them, but they were a little, little snarky. They said, well, it wouldn't hurt. Everybody else has prayed and nothing happened. It's kind of like, you know, God's not working miracles anymore. I said, well, maybe, maybe. But let's pray together. I want you guys to agree with me. So I knelt down beside her bed, asked permission to put my hand on her shoulder, and I prayed over her. And I said, Lord, take this fever away so this surgery can be done and this woman's life can be spared so that your name can be exalted. And while I'm talking, the door opens. It was the five-minute mark. Nurse comes in while I'm still praying. She waited. I heard her come in. I finished Sticks the thermometer in, pulls it out. She walks over to the wall, picks up the phone, says, we're ready. Her fever's gone. You can give the Lord a hand. The people in the room, the people in the room said, how did you do that? I said, I didn't do a thing. I just touched the throne of God on behalf of you, and we agreed together, and the Lord did this so his name would be exalted. I dismissed myself. I don't even know who those folks are. I just went on. I had many more ministries to do and many more folks to minister to. So there's another story. I, I, I could go on and on and on with these. Um, let me share a couple more that are important. Uh, just several weeks ago, the staff, you know, all in the midst of all of this going on, I mean, we cranked up a live stream to the world. We were just doing it for folks at home, and you had to get a, a, a private link and everything. But then we just decided we'll open it to the world. Well, you know, I mean, we, we, our, our equipment's not up to standards for really having really top-notch like these mega churches have. You know, it's like you're sitting in the pew there. We, we just didn't have that. But we were going to use what we had, so we did. In the meantime, some of our computers have hit the dust. And our soundboard, if you noticed, is kind of hitting the dust. And <laughs> various things are going on with audiovisual. But, but we're in the middle of all of this. And, you know, people have been faithful. And with tithes, we don't owe anything. We have no debt, so we're not broke. But, you know, times are uncertain. And it takes thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to redo all of that and get the proper equipment and computers and cameras and all of the equipment where people can see it and be a part of the service from all over the world. And so we're in staff meetings saying, look, we really, we, sh we, sh we shouldn't spend, we can't, we can't, we can't spend money out of the general budget right now. It wouldn't be right, even though, even though I consider this to be almost essential because it's the doors to the church now opening to the world. See, we consider worshiping essential. See, our governor said that. Churches are essential in Florida. Of course, we knew that. We were already open when he said it. But, but I consider it essential that now we minister to the world. But, so we just started praying, talking about it. About a week later, my staff can testify to this. A check comes to us from a family that doesn't even come here. They don't even live in this state. And a check comes in for thousands and thousands of dollars. And it was designated for audio, visual, and streaming equipment. And they, they didn't have any idea we were praying that or asking. Okay? So we were celebrating that in last week's staff meeting saying, look how God answers prayer. That's miraculous, folks. It's a prayer. I believe in the power of prayer, but I don't really think he answers it anymore. And he don't work miracles. And yeah, pray, Pastor, for, pray for me. So I don't know if he'll do anything, but that's the church in America. So we're celebrating this last week. And uh, I said, well, we got enough to get started, a good start. We're still going to need thousands more. I know some of you are thinking, he's trying to raise money. No, I'm not. I want your money. I want heaven's gates to open. I want some miracles to come down. I'm not, trying to, I'm not asking for your money, folks watching by live stream. 
We're not that kind of church. I'm not that kind of preacher. I'm telling you stories of miracles witnessed by many people. So hang on. So last week, you still need much, much more. Yesterday, my wife and I are out mowing the yard. I've got one of those um, zero-turn mowers. So now I can't get my wife off of it. <laughs> it was like the only toy I had left. She has discovered it now. It's like, it's like flying a helicopter, you know. Son, thing is fun. I don't know how it makes her feel. It makes me feel like a man. I'm on that thing. That's what I say. But so she's doing the back part of the yard where it's big open field. She's not real cool with getting up around edges and stuff. Did you know that we have to mow the grass and pay the bills? Even in the middle of prophet prophecy opening up? I mean, I, don't, I guess we don't have to, but <laughs> we lose our home and we live in a jungle. <laughs> so we mow the grass and pay the bills. So we were out in the yard doing that. And then it came my turn. I was going to do the front. It's a lot harder to mow. There's stumps and roots and stuff everywhere. So got big oak trees and stuff. So it came my turn. And uh, really, I wanted the whole yard to be my turn. But the one thing I enjoy doing outside, I said, I'm going to do it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but she was much sweeter than that. But watch this. So get a phone call. Standing in the front yard yesterday, a man and a woman, um, sh they don't want their names spoken, and you wouldn't know them anyway, probably. They're not even from here. You know, they don't live here. They had been in a service or two here as they would come through the area. This is what she said. My wife standing there, I had her on speakerphone, my wife listening to everything. And I'm going to have to paraphrase, but she will attest that what I'm saying is true. She says, Pastor... You may not remember me, but my name is so-and-so. My husband's name is so-and-so. And I said, well, you know, the name is familiar. I said, I think I, I can see you in my mind because she told me where they sat and when they were here. And, and I really do. I think, I think I can vaguely see them. And she said, we spoke just very briefly. And I said, okay. And I, I said, how can I help you? And she says, God has spoken something to me, I'm convinced, but I need you to tell me if this is true or not. And I said, okay. She says, the Lord told me that you guys needed substantial and wanted substantial upgrade in audio visual. And because you're now streaming to the world and, and God just told me that this was your heart's desire. She says, now, before I go any further, am I, am I anywhere near? I'm, I'm sitting there going, uh, yeah. That's what our prayer was last week, and we've been praying about that. And she says, okay, praise God. She says, then I'm not crazy. Then, then, then that's what he spoke. I said, that's what he spoke. I said, hey, you, how did you? I, she, I didn't know. She said, God spoke to me. I said, okay. She said, I'm writing the check right now. I'm not even going to give the amount. Let me just say thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. She wrote this check. She says, I'm writing the check. Can I designate it to audiovisual? And I said, it's your money. It's God's money that God's told you. She says, that's what I want to do. You've told me that's what you need. I said, thank you. That was yesterday. Now we have enough money to do everything we need to do. And it didn't come even from this place. But God doesn't work miracles. He don't answer prayer. No, all that stuff is dead. That stuff's gone. Jesus said, in greater things than these you shall do if you would have faith. And you know, it's funny when he says the greater things, he didn't tell us what those would be. He just, yeah, well, you, well Carl, you know, Jesus raised the dead. Uh, excuse me. We've had that happen here. Well, he healed the sick. Impossible. Excuse me. We've had that happen here. Well, he opened up the floodgates of heaven and he poured out blessing. Excuse me. <laughs> We're living in the midst of that now. Let me repeat a little bit from last week's message, then I'm going to close. Door shutting all around us. Resurrection Sunday down the tube all over the world. Shavuot today down the tube in most places of the world. We said we're going to keep the doors open. We used our heads. We were kind and gracious to people. We shut everything down except for morning worship but we're not going to close the church and we covered ourselves in the scripture we preached the word 
we went out in the midst of tornadoes and we helped a family for a week. As I said last week, we swapped sweat and breathed on each other and hugged each other and we did chainsaws together and drove tractors and loaded trailers and hauled it to the dump. The dump. No germs there. <laughs> Come to church, it'll kill you, but you can go to the dump. <laughs> So get back to me. That's been going on. Here we are. And I'm going to say it again. I said it last week, and I'm going to say it again. All glory to Jesus. All glory to Jesus. Not a single infection among us. Nobody of us went to the hospitals. Nobody of us went on respirators, and nobody of us died. You can give the Lord Jesus a hand of praise. It is a witness. It is a testimony of this church. Miracles still happen. God answers prayers. If we're... Faithful to stand in his word. Psalm 91. President, call. yes? I'm kidding. I want to look at something here. I want you to hear something. Y'all are so Easter fool. All right. I, uh, before the churches went on lockdown and before the COVID thing became a worldwide panic, we had a worship service in here centered around a particular song. I preached from the scriptures, the song that, it, that well, the song was written. Iris sang the solo. We all praised God and said, oh, that's, that's so amazing. That's right. Let that be me, Lord. Churches all over the world have been singing this. And a lot of those churches just closed when all of this happened. I want you to hear the words we sang. And they come right out of the scriptures from a certain event in the New Testament. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing the words. Here we go. <clears throat> you call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. But there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep. My faith will stand, and I will call upon your name. And I will keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours and you are mine. Your grace abounds in the deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and few surround me, you've never failed. And you won't start now. So I will call upon your name. I will keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours and you are mine. Spirit, lead me. That's how the church was born. That's our power. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. <laughs> really? <laughs> How'd that work out for you, church, all over the world? Let me walk upon the waters. Wherever you would call me, take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and then my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And I will call upon your name, and I will keep my eyes above those waves, and my soul will rest in your embrace, because I am yours, and you are mine. Probably should put it in his pocket. I am yours, and you are mine. That comes, of course, from Peter getting out of the boat. When the storm was raging around him and God asked him to do the impossible. Hikra Hammock was asked to do the impossible in the midst of this raging storm. And we did it and we've still done it. Our faith has been made stronger. Now we are a living miracle. We're still living in the midst of it. And shame on us if we don't tell it. And shame on us if we don't use it to the glory of Jesus' name. Always give Jesus glory. Never, never, never say, look what we did then God will probably strike you and me and all of us dead. But if we will just say, look what God did. Look 
look what he did. We were, we were foolish enough, the world would say, to stand in his word and claim his promise. In the day of pestilence, it will not touch you if you will keep your eyes on me. Psalm 91. Revelation 3, Church of Philadelphia. If you will lift up my name, if you'll stand in the word, if you'll hold back the enemies of God with your hand, I will deliver you. I will protect you. I will keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come upon the whole earth. That hour of trial is starting. Starting. I don't set dates. That hour may be 100 more years before we get to the end of that hour. All I know is it is starting. It's time to be saved. It's time to be baptized. That's what Peter said. You got to repent. You got to be saved. You got to be baptized. Now is the time because the signs and wonders are happening. The old men are dreaming dreams. <laughs> Things are happening. Signs and wonders everywhere. Look at the Middle East. Look at Israel. Look at Jerusalem. Look at the cities burning all over America. Look at lawlessness in the only constitutional republic the world has ever known, founded upon the Word of God, and cities are burning all over America today. Signs before our eyes. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I'm going to keep standing. And I know many of you will as well. And we're going to love folks. And we're going to be gracious and kind and patient. But people are now listening. Not everybody, but a whole lot of people that weren't listening are now. And you know what they're saying? Maybe different words, but here's what they're saying. What must I do to be saved? Repent. Surrender to Jesus and be baptized. And the Holy Spirit of God will come upon you. And you will be marked with a seal. And then you have been given the right, John chapter 1, then you have been given the right at that point to be called a son of God. Now, I know women are saying, but I'm a daughter. I, I, I know. But that term son of God comes from the Hebrew, b'nai Elohim, which means children, but it's even more than that. It's now we're right up next to the throne of God. We're like Adam and Eve who walked with God and would not die until they rejected God's love. You will have the right to be called B'nai Elohim. And you surrender to Jesus. That's what you do. Romans 10, 9 says it like this. If you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Can I get an amen, church? Give the Lord a hand of praise. For I am convinced, Romans 8, 28, I am convinced that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. The church was born today, 2,000 years ago. It was born in power. It was born in miracles. It was born in signs and wonders. We are now the body of Christ. Jesus said you will do greater things even than these. You just go out and be my disciples. Be my ambassadors. Take my message to the world because I'm coming soon and the world needs to hear it. And I'm telling you, folks, you're hard-pressed to find it in person anywhere in the world still. And in some churches in America, if you do, you can go in and hear it, but you better not sing because the singing police will come arrest you. I hadn't figured out how they're going to do that yet. You know me. County Commission told us we couldn't sing. Son, we'd have a choir festival here. <laughs> uh, I, I'm t and I'd go to jail for it if need be. And you say, well, they'll put you in jail. Well, then I'll just go. But ain't nobody going to tell me I can't sing to Jesus. I mean, that's like Daniel. You can't pray. Can't pray in your own house. Daniel said, and we'll put you in the lion's den. Daniel said, <laughs> Maybe Daniel was singing to the lions. I've said enough. I'm sorry. I've got another hour's worth of material. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. No, 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 no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Let's pray. We'll dismiss. I've enjoyed this morning with you. Don't forget Bible studies tomorrow night. We'll talk about that later. But right now, our prayer minister's coming. Our um, counselors are coming.